So here I have several different examples of capacitors. This one is a coaxial cable. So in the middle, it's got a conducting wire. Around that, it's got some insulating material. And then it's surrounded by a conducting sheath. And then usually there's some more insulating material on the outside. So because we've got two conductors separated by an insulator, this acts as a capacitor. Here I've got a variable capacitor that we'll look at in a bit more detail shortly. And then I've got lots of different capacitors that all plug into electric circuits. So you can see these come in all different shapes and sizes. Here's a really large one. Since they plug into electric circuits, they have their own symbol for in-circuit diagrams. Their symbol looks like this. So this shows that a capacitor consists of two conductors separated by a gap. The electric current cannot flow across the gap in the capacitor. If we have a charged capacitor and we want to discharge it, one way to do this is to use a conducting wire to connect the positive and negative sides of the capacitor. When we do that, the negative charge can flow to the positive charge cancelling out and we now have no charge left on our capacitor. Now for many applications, a high capacitance is desirable. So capacitance with a high capacitance can store a large amount of charge for the same potential difference. So there's several ways that we can increase the capacitance of a physical capacitor. So recalling our equation for parallel plates capacitors, that C is equal to A epsilon naught on D, where A is the surface area and D is the distance between the plates, we can see that if we increase the surface area A, then we're going to increase the capacitance. However, physically, this really isn't very feasible for many applications. We can't have enormous capacitor plates. So a smarter way of doing this is to take two capacitor plates and then what we can do is roll it up. So we've then got a large area between the plates, but it's still in a manageable volume to get that higher capacitance. Another thing we could change is the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught. So epsilon naught holds for a vacuum and it's very similar for air, but different materials can have different permittivities. So we'll be learning about this in the next lecture where we learn about dielectrics. So by replacing the air gap with some other material with a high dielectric constant, we can actually increase the capacitance. Now we can also construct capacitors with a variable capacitance, such as this gap tuning capacitor here. This capacitor allows us to change the area by turning the plates like this. So when the plates are like this, there is very little area between them, and so it has a very low capacitance. And then when the plates go back in between like this, we've now got a much higher area between them, and so a much higher capacitance. Now, capacitors are essentially charge storage devices. And since they can store charge, which can be later discharged as an electric current, they're also storing energy. Again, we'll be looking at the equation that we can use to calculate this in a later lecture. Now, capacitors can work much like a battery. However, once they start discharging, they tend to discharge fairly quickly. So they're useful for applications where we only need the current provided for a short amount of time. So for example, capacitors are often used to power pacemakers because here we just need a short, sharp current in order to start the heart beating again. They're also useful in cameras for the flash and they can be also be used in uninterruptible power supplies, UPSs. The capacitor gives the computer time to, ch to shut down safely, meaning that we don't lose all our data if there's a sudden power out.